All right, today is September 5th, 2021, and we are continuing our biography series with Gerald Horn. Uh, welcome back, Professor Horn. Thank you. Uh, picking up from where we left off, uh, the year is 1959, mm. and you are about 10 years old, um, and your neighborhood is undergoing what the government referred to as urban renewal, where close to 20,000 uh, black residents were bulldozed out of their homes. Uh, your neighborhood, Mill Creek Valley, apparently got the nickname uh, Hiroshima Flats. Uh, like many places across the country, this land remained vacant for years and eventually was turned into expressways to the suburbs and shopping. Uh, as a child of 10 years age, of 10 years of age or so, what was your understanding of what was going on at that time? Well, I really can't recall. Um, I probably was excited, you know, it's always exciting to move and experience new things. Um, and I guess, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I guess the, the, the new place in North St. Louis, I mean, it's still there. My sister lives there. It's, it's really not that big, <laughs> basically. But, I understand they gave our family some pittance, which then could be used as a down payment mm -hmm. for the new place. And it's interesting. I remember St. Louis then, the, the thing for all the Black people who were being pushed out of Mill Creek Valley was to see how, how further west you could get to St. Louis. I still don't have a clear idea of the geography of St. Louis, even though I was born and raised there. But I know that we didn't move that far west. <laughs> and so to many people that was seen as, as something of a, of a demerit. Although because of segregation, our neighbors were oftentimes part of the black middle class. I mean, you know, there were black doctors living around the corner, for example, because we were all packed into this one neighborhood. But of course, then as Jim Crow began to retreat, they were one of the first families to move. Mm. Um, not that I think I might have said that living on the same block, although they might have come after us, was the, the Bowie family, you know, the musician, Lester Bowie, artist of Chicago. Uh, Joe Bowie, who played, as I think I said, he played with my brother. He was a trombonist. Still around. Joe is still around. He's probably in Europe now. Um, and the patriarch of the family was a music teacher at Sumner High School, which is a, was, maybe still is for all I know, a very well-known black high school in St. Louis. I, th I think Dick Gregory, the late comic, went to Sumner High School, if I'm not mistaken. So that's, that's what I recall. And while you uh, were excited by the move, how did your parents react to having their family and community uprooted, do you recall? Well, I don't recall them being that upset about it because as, as I said, I mean, I think we, we were able to get a down payment on another place mm -hmm. in a neighborhood that was thought to be a be better neighborhood by many. So, I assume they considered it a, a, a step up the class ladder. Mm. Uh, not, that's just an assumption. Uh, I don't recall that many arguments about that. But then again, <laughs> I mean, this is a long time ago. So, right. uh, I don't, there's a lot about that period I don't recall. And do you know if your family went from, from renting to owning? Oh, no, I think we owned that place in Mill Creek Valley, if I'm not mistaken. We certainly owned a new place, for sure. I'm almost sure we own, because as I said, I think we got a down payment once they, as a matter of fact, the place in Mill Creek Valley was a two family flat. Mm -hmm. And the top floor was oftentimes rented out to relatives. So um, now how they got that, you know, I was born into that house, so I, I don't know how they, how or why they moved into that house. 
in my understanding, I think in a, a jazz interview you gave about your jazz book you gave recently, I think you moved to the 1400 block of Dryden Avenue. Oh, 41, 4125. The zip code is 663115. And that's Dryden Avenue. Dryden Avenue in St. Louis. I assume it's named after the British guy Dryden. That's, that, that was always my assumption. I never looked it up. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know who that is. Yeah. But, um, and uh, what were the, the conditions of, of your new home as in comparison to the, your previous home? Well, I think it was perceived as a better neighborhood. And it was right within walking distance, maybe 30 yards from this place called Wesley House which was a place that had playgrounds and also uh, afternoon activities for neighborhood youth. And that's when I first began playing soccer. St. Louis used to be, maybe still is as far as I know, a big soccer camp capital in the United States. St. Louis University used to compete all the time for the NCAA championships in soccer. And so unlike many people, I played a lot of soccer, unlike many black people in the United States that is. But also basketball, because there was a basketball court there, baseball, softball, football, um, and all the rest. That I did all of that from the age of, I guess, 10 or 11 till 17 when I went away to college. Yeah, and I recall, I, I recall learning that you played football in high school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not the varsity. <laughs> <laughs> I was a scrub. <laughs> Do you recall what, what position you played? Let's see. I know I played linebacker. Okay. Uh, I was a, obviously a frail linebacker. That's for sure. Um, our football team wasn't even the B team. I was on the B team. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't recall us being very good. I don't recall the varsity being very good either. Mm hmm my understanding, I know I'm jumping ahead a bit, is that your, your high school was known for its baseball stars. Yeah, I don't remember any big names, though. I, I know some of my good friends, because I used to walk a lot to Beaumont High School. I guess it was about a two-mile walk. And sometimes along the way, I would stop by a friend's house and, who lived closer to the school and we walked together. Now he played baseball. I knew a lot, of, I, I still remember a lot of the baseball players. This friend I'm referring to, his name is John Hilton. He passed away a year or two ago. And there was another a baseball guy, uh, Odell Stringer, Zach Atkins. Those are the only baseball guys I recall. Um, so. And did you have growing up, I didn't know you had, you had referenced St. Louis Cardinals being uh, one of your favorite baseball teams, but your mother was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. That's right. I mean, who were your in LA Dodgers after '59? In LA Dodgers. Do you have um, uh, other teams that you supported growing up? Well, sure. The uh, football Cardinals, of course, who moved from Chicago. The uh, <laughs> the St. Louis Hawks, who moved to Atlanta. As a matter of fact, I recall that this may have been 1959. Uh, I remember writing a, I think it was a poem about uh, the Baltimore Colts beating the New York Giants mm -hmm. in a uh, football championship. Because for the Baltimore Colts, there was Lenny Moore, number 24. So, you know. <laughs> and I recall also writing fiction about the St. Louis Hawks basketball team because they were notorious racists. Although I'm not sure if I realized that at the time. Uh, Bob Pettit, Clyde Lavellet, who actually went to KU where my brother, University of Kansas where my brother wound up going. Cliff Hagen, who I think was out of Kentucky. The only black player, player I recall is Cy Hugo Green, who was out of Duquesne. Although he wasn't a big scorer, he was known for his defense. Lenny Wilkins used to play for the St. Louis Hawks, who wound up coaching the New York Knicks. Mm -hmm. I think he was out of Providence, if I'm not mistaken. He certainly had an East Coast accent. Uh, so I followed the Hawks before they moved. And are you still fans of those teams? Not, not the Hawks after they moved to Atlanta. I mean, 
uh, although uh, I did like Lou Hudson, who wound up playing for the Atlanta Hawks. I liked a lot of the Atlanta Hawks players, but I didn't follow a team. Dominique Wilkins. Uh, after the St. Louis Cardinals moved to Arizona, I really didn't follow them that much. Mm-hmm. I still, I still follow the Cardinals because it's sort of an institution in St. Louis. I mean, it's, it's a point of conversation in St. Louis. I mean, it's a big deal to have this baseball team that's generally competitive. Mm-hmm. I think the city feels proud <laughs> that they have a, a baseball team that's competitive. And back to your your move to Dryden Avenue, how did the the white folk respond <laughs> to <laughs> the influx? Uh, I don't think they were too happy, but since they moved out so quickly, they didn't, they didn't have much of an opportunity to, uh, to, to express their unhappiness. This reminds me of the scene from uh, Brother from Another Planet, John Sayles film. You ever see that? Mm-hmm. Remember the scene on the, the number two and three train going uptown? And the character says, watch me make all the white people disappear. They get to 96th Street, right? Everybody gets off. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I do recall wandering into certain neighborhoods and being chased out, but mm. I don't really recall the details. Um, and did you have nicknames growing up? Oh, God, for, for sure. Uh, my, my sister still called me Mickey. I think, I think my ears finally caught up with my head. <laughs> Originally, they hadn't. <laughs> and then if you look at my high school yearbook, the nickname that's under my picture is Wahoo, which comes from supposedly, actually, I sort of remember uh, playing football and making an interception and maybe being exultant, hmm. shouting that. <laughs> uh, you know, that stuff. So maybe you were better in football than, than you let us know. And, uh, and, you know, the, that, that, that's still, those two names still are sort of St. Louis names. They didn't follow me. Uh-huh. But your sister still call you Mickey? Oh, of course. Right. <laughs> and did, did you have any pets growing up? <laughs> in, in Mill Creek Valley. We used to have dogs, they'd run away. They said, it's too tough out here. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> so they would always run away. <laughs> so I think we could do better out of this place. <laughs> That's what that means. Uh, and you had mentioned um, seeing your grandparents and extended family and kind, oh, yeah. kind of church clothes. Oh, yeah. Um, was, was your family religious growing up? Not really, my, not really. <laughs> you know, my mother, my mother, I think she used to try to encourage us to go to church, but she didn't go. Uh, she, of course, she would have an excuse. You know, she was busy working, whatever. And then after a while, I was at my newspaper route on Sunday morning. Mm. So that kept me from going. Then, of course, my father, he definitely never went. Interesting thing about my father, though, is that, um, you know, as I said, he drove a truck. He didn't go to church, so he had no necessary need for having suits. He had all these suits, <laughs> you know, and I never could figure out, figure that out, although somewhat related is that certainly for a number of black men, and I've experienced this myself, that you get treated better if you're well-dressed. Mm-hmm. So then it forces you to, to spend money on clothes. Mm-hmm. And I remember actually when I was living in New York one time, that, that used to be the, the mantra of many of the middle class Black people, men, I would talk to. You have to be well appointed. 
but I never was into suits. I mean, for a certain while as a youth, I think I was into, you know, certain kinds of, um, well, let, let's say that I, I dress more casually now than I probably did when I was in high school, believe it or not. Because after a while, I think this was probably a matter of politicization. I became, after I began to figure out that idea that you get treated better, if you spent money on clothes, well, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So I began to reject the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and actually, as, as I might've said, that, that's probably one of the reasons I didn't go into law. I didn't, work, I didn't feel like wearing a suit. Yeah, I remember you telling me that when we met. But... Yeah, it just didn't make any sense to me. So that was, that was uh, a barrier. Although I, I will say this, I was, you know, thinking about this conversation. Uh, growing up, particularly, I would say, from the age of 13 or 14, believe it or not, until I went away to college at 17, myself and my friends, we used to spend a lot of time partying. Not only in St. Louis, but in East St. Louis, which is sort of a wide open town. Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like the towns across the river from um, Cincinnati, for example. Um, so I mean, you, you could, as a teenager, as a young teenager, you could go to East St. Louis and be at some club to three or four in the morning, 14 years old, believe it or not. And, and no one would look at you differently. It's a wide open town. And I would say, basically, from that point, from being 13 or 14 into my, I was in my late 30s, I was at parties all the time, every weekend. Um, I would say until I left New York, which was in 1988, 89. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's my late 30s. I was at parties all the time. Although, at a certain point when I was living in New York, I would, uh, I, I was living in the Upper West Side. And so Saturday night, I would uh, get the Sunday New York Times. And sometimes I'd go to these parties and I'd find a back room and read the Sunday New York Times and then finish it. And then I'd come out and party because then it seemed like, you know, I'm ahead of the game. I've read the paper already. This is what I'm to talk about. Well, not only that, but I'm, I feel ahead, I'm ahead of the game. I mean, I, I finished the Sunday paper on Saturday night. <laughs> you know, it's like a time travel. Um, and was, um, was, was there a particular denomination, back to the whole religion uh, topic, was there a particular denomination? Baptist. Baptist. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting, in my 16th century book, well, anybody who reads it will see, I write very critically about um, the Protestant faith, so-called, which is ironic since like 90% of black Americans who profess religiosity, likely Protestants, uh, even though, as I talk about in the book, they were essential to slavery, and the slave trade, much more in terms of black Americans in the present day United States and colonial North America. Not least, of course, because London switches to Protestant faith in the 1530s, as you call. And so therefore, it's, you know, it's ironic that that's, that's sort of imparted, so to speak. Yeah, and did, as a child, did you, were you disillusioned about religion? Did you have, did you well, have about you know, religion? like like many people, like like many questions. You know, it's just like questions that lead you to write books. Um, at a certain point, it's just like thinking about the origins of the United States and the traditional narrative. At a certain point, you say, "This doesn't make any sense to me." <laughs> you know, am I the only one that, that, that sees some sort of? <laughs> sort of flaw in this story. And I think 
certainly at an early age with regard to religion, I was saying that this doesn't make any sense to me uh, because, you know, why are these Negroes treated so terribly? I mean, you know, uh, why was Mississippi allowed to happen? I mean, there are, you know, there are lots of questions and the answers that are forthcoming are unsatisfactory. I mean, as you probably gather, uh, many people go through that sort of process, you know, with regard to the scientific method, for example, with regard to scientific breakthroughs. For, oftentimes it's not in, the, in terms of scientific break, breakthroughs, it's not necessarily that something that doesn't make sense. Although sometimes you hear the scientists say that it, they detect a flaw in the methodology, basically, that then they choose to try to unravel. And so to, to, to look at it positively, certainly seeing all this religiosity in the black community, it, it caused a lot of questions in my head. Uh, not necessarily answers, but certainly questions. The answers I would like to think came later. And you recall as, as a child around what age those lights? Well, this is started. early on. This is early on. I, 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 I would say eight, nine years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, because that's when I started the sort of reading regime. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the more you read, of course, hopefully, the more intelligence, I mean, that is to say, like, information intelligence in that sense, the more information that's imparted to you, which then gives you a further foundation to raise questions. Turning now to kind of your teenage years, um, I'm guessing that you went to junior high school from about- well, No, you go from eighth grade to ninth grade high school. So eighth grade graduating at Ashland School in North St. Louis, and then to Beaumont High School in the ninth grade in North St. Louis. I think both were still around, if I'm not mistaken. I do recall that in the eighth grade, I had this teacher, no, not in the eighth grade, maybe in the fourth grade. Wow. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, maybe in the third or fourth grade. I had this teacher, Miss Markham, I think her name was, and she had gone to Egypt for a vacation or a tour. And, you know, naturally she brought back slides of her tour. This is a Euro-American teacher, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I, I still remember that because it sort of perked my interest uh, in Egypt. Um, and this is, of course, Egypt was in the news then. That's why I remember it, because, you know, 1956 is the Suez crisis uh, when Britain, France, and Israel attacked Nasser's Egypt over control of the Suez Canal. And both the United States and the Soviet Union get the three parties to back down. And of course, this is real turning. I just use this analogy with regard to Afghanistan because the Suez crisis convinced London that the jig was up concerning the British Empire. So they began to tie their aprons tie themselves to the apron strings of Uncle Sam, you know, the special relationship, special only to one party, the London. <laughs> and then France took a contrary position and still is. I think I point, maybe I didn't point out, I know I've said it on the radio, that just a few days ago, you had this meeting of the uh, Arab nations and uh, Iranians in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And of course, Macron sh shows up. <laughs> you know, sticking out like a sore thumb because, you know, the deck is being reshuffled. I mean, U.S. imperialism as the guarantor for world imperialism is now up for grabs. Uh, but in any case, going back to St. Louis, I, rec I recall that, that slideshow it was probably 56 of their about when, when Egypt was in the news. And if I'm not mistaken, the Suez crisis was in the fall of 56 to be more specific. Right, and your, my understanding is one of your projects you're working on now is, is related to Egypt. Oh, absolutely. I've been watching these travelogues uh, concerning Egypt uh, hmm. 
my from Netflix. My, that's one of my subjects I'm pursuing in my spare time now. Um, and in junior high school, how did you do academically? Oh, I did fine. Uh, as I said, my report cards are probably still in that house, uh, although my sister denies it. <laughs> I'm sure they're there, though. They're there, though. But I, I, I recall doing well. Uh, I think that I was deeply influenced by my sisters. And I think I mentioned this last week. Mm -hmm. And so I would read the books, magazines that they would read. I even still remember the songs. I mean, because, you know, being young women, they were taken by these crooners. Like, I think he's still alive. Johnny Mathis, you familiar with Johnny Mathis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, you know, Johnny Mathis, uh, he was wildly popular at one time. And if I'm not mistaken, a fun fact, I think he went to high school with Bill Russell, the basketball player. Uh -huh. Okay. So my sisters love Johnny Mathis. So I still know most of his repertoire. I mean, the lyrics. I used to sing them all the time. That's only because of them. So your sisters were major influences in terms of your, your book taste and your, and oh, your music. Oh, yeah. Intellectual taste. Like, I, 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 in reading my yearbook, I just realized that I was in the Spanish club in high school. Wow. And that comes directly from my older sister, who was a, a Romance Languages specialist. I mean, she specialized in Spanish language literature. She taught in Colombia. Oh, that's awesome. And so that's a direct, direct influence from her. As a matter of fact, I was thinking probably the best subjects I took in high school were Spanish and typing. At least those are the ones that stick out in my mind. Yeah, I, I recall taking typing in high school and dreading it, but now I'm very happy that I did it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm a fast typist. Um, and do, do you recall what types of books that you read growing up? Were they novels? I read lots of biographies mm -hmm. of all sorts. Mm -hmm. read a lot of stuff about sports. I remember in our house, we had a copy of the baseball encyclopedia. So I read that all the way through. And of course, you know, a lot of that still sticks in my head. I mean, but you know, <laughs> if you watch baseball, it's easy to get these statistics stuck in your brain. You know, like Joe DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak in 1941, or I think 1941 was when Ted Williams hit 406. You know, Babe Ruth hitting 714 home runs. So, you know, you remember, at least I remember all this stuff. So was baseball your, your favorite sport growing up? It's probably because of the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. The influence of the Cardinals. And then, you know, I don't know if you listen to baseball games. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a zen experience because these announcers they just gab and gab and gab because, you know, there's so much downtime. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, oh, and so in St. Louis, uh, we had what were regarded to be leading baseball announcers. There's Jack Buck, mm. the father of Joe Buck, who now does baseball in the NFL with uh, Troy Aikman. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, Harry Carey. Who then mm. moved on to Chicago Cubs, used to lead the Wrigley Field fans in Chicago and take me out to the ball game every seventh inning. Mm. And then there was Joe Garagiola, who was from St. Louis. His claim to fame that he was a good friend of Yogi Berra, who, of course, was the Yankee catcher who was also from St. Louis, mm. from the Hill community in Italian uh, St. Louis. And uh, he, Joe Garagiola, he wound up being a host on the Today Show. I mean, he, he really climbed the ladder. And uh, he was a catcher. I never, he used to always call the equipment that the catchers put on when they sit behind the plate as the tools of ignorance. Because he says, nobody with any sense would be a catcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, is baseball still your favorite sport? 
No, probably basketball. I mm -hmm. mean, I still follow baseball, although, yeah, I still follow baseball, although the statistics have gotten much more complex since my time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to confess, maybe you can explain it to me. <laughs> to explain wins above replacement, for example. No, baseball is the, the sport I probably, of the major sports, it's the one I follow the least. Yeah, I mean, I still, you know, I know earn run average. I mean, I remember all the stuff from when I was small. Earn run average, RBIs, batting average. Yeah, I know all that, but they've developed these new these new statistical measures. So, who, what's your NBA team that you follow? Uh, I, I, it probably varies. Uh huh. It probably it, it depends probably on who's winning. <laughs> Uh, since I used to live in Southern California, I guess I followed the Lakers to a, a certain degree because they were the California team. It, it, it varies depending on who players are, no, none in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is it, going back to junior high school, is there anything else that stands out from junior high school that you haven't mentioned? You no, know, just the partying and uh, <laughs> going to East St. Louis. I, I, I do remember an episode which was probably a turning point. I think about this a lot. So as I said, there was this basketball court uh, not far from our house. And I once got into some sort of fracas with another player and it got rather heated. Hmm. And so I went home and got a, a knife. Hmm. And then I confronted the guy but he backed down. I'm God, I'm happy he did. Because I was thinking that, that that happens so often with young people. Mm -hmm. Make this one mistake when you're 14 to 50, and it determines the entire trajectory of your life. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, God, I'm glad he backed down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's intense. Yeah. And then um, in terms of high school, I think you mentioned you went to Beaumont High School. Beaumont. Beaumont. I pronounced it wrong. Blue Jackets. And at that time, or just prior, um, Beaumont um, historically uh, was in the middle of the civil rights movement and integration. Yeah, you know, as, as I said, uh, there's this, as Henry Kissinger might say, a decent interval, or maybe an indecent interval, from the time the Negroes move in and everybody else moves out. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so Beaumont, just like my neighborhood in North Carolina, there was an interval, a very quick transition. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at my yearbook, you would think it was 100% black school. That wasn't the way it was when I entered, but it quickly changed. Yeah, man, what I, I my brief research, um, I, it, I found that Beaumont was racially integrated in September 1954. Um, that a big knife knife fight broke out between the black students and the white students. Oh, what year was that? 54. The knife fight? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. And then in uh, 56, uh, Beaumont's integration was featured in a documentary film entitled no. a, a, City, a City Decides that was oh. nominated for an Academy Award. Is that right? I wonder if I can find that on YouTube. Yeah, it's a, it's a short, apparently. It's not a long film, but it's, uh, I, did, I did a quick search for it and didn't automatically find it. Okay. Um, and then apparently after the closure of Little Rock Central High School in 1958, uh, due, due to its integration crisis, three members of Little, Little Rock Nine completed their coursework at, at Beaumont. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if one of them was the one whose last name was Green because I wound up knowing his son because he teaches at the University of Chicago. He wrote a book about Chicago, Adam Green. I should have taken down the names, uh, yeah. but I, I didn't. The older Green used to work for Clinton, as a matter of fact, being from Arkansas. Um, and what were some of the things that stand out about your high school years? Well, other than the partying and the sport, <laughs> and uh, I told you about the improvisation, the acting, uh, you know, the, the usual sorts of, uh, I remember after, after that incident, 
with the knife, I really, I think, I think it sort of chastened me. So, which is good. <laughs> so, I would often, because you know, with, with teenage boys, I, often, I would oftentimes after that back down from confrontations. Mm-hmm. It really chastened me because I realized my whole life could have changed. So I remember backing down from confrontations, which of course doesn't give you a positive reputation. Mm-hmm. But um, I remember participating in lots of activities, you know, sports, student newspaper. Oh, I was an advice to the, uh, I was an advice columnist for the student newspaper, although I would make up the letters and then give her. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of my comedy training. Uh, I think you were the editor of the school newspaper. In yeah, I was one of the editors. I think I was a senior editor or something like that. Okay. You were uh, also the editor of the yearbook? Yeah, I was an editor of the yearbook. I was involved in lots of activities. That's probably what helped, helped me get me into Princeton, actually. And um, before we get to Princeton, how did, how did you do academically in high school? Well, you know, I did. I probably had an A average, mm-hmm. or very close to it. Um, I'm, not, I'm almost sure about that. And you had talked a, a lot about um, going to East St. Louis with yeah. with your brothers, your two brothers, and your friends. Well, I would you know, mostly go with my friends. Okay, in my age cohort. And you, uh, you went. Uh, there was a lot of music involved. Well, you know, St. Louis, St. Louis, that's where Miles Davis is from Alton, which is right next to East St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Hamiet Blewett, who used to be the world saxophone quartet. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Leon Thomas, the singer and sort of yodeler, <laughs> used to be St. Louis. You know, it, of course, the Jackie Joyner Kersey, uh, the Olympic. St. Louis, East St. Louis has produced, uh, and then of course it was the site of the notorious pogrom circa 1917. I wrote about that in my uh, Japan book, mm-hmm. Facing the Rising Sun. My understanding is that in addition to Miles Davis, there was also Chuck Berry. Oh yeah, that you yeah I, I grew up listening to Chuck Berry for sure. And I, I, I might, you know, Chuck Berry had this place, I think he had this place in Wentzville, W-E-N-T-Z-ville. Hmm. I know, I know my classmates used to go out to Winsville. I don't recall ever going out there, although I, I may have. I know I went to Grant's farm. I'm not sure if it was Ulysses S. Grant's actual farm. It probably was, but it had been taken over by Anheuser-Busch, mm. their company, which of course, historically has been a lodestar in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. So it, it was sort of a animal. They would have animals, you'd be in a little train, Sort of, sort of like the Bronx Zoo, that you'd be on this train and you would go through the animals. Mm-hmm. I recall doing that at Grant's Farm. And back to hanging out with your friends in East St. Louis, did, did your parents, were they aware? Was it something? Yeah, you yeah they, they, they knew. And, you know, I remember my mother, she would always stay up until I came back, mm-hmm. which I always told her was unnecessary. But now I, I sort of understand why she did that. Because, you know, it, it, <laughs> it was a wild experience. I mean, first of all, it, it, I'm almost sure I remember driving across the Mississippi River from either St. Louis to East St. Louis or back, that somehow we got on the train track when a train was coming. And then had to back up quickly. I mean, this is our primitive St. Louis. Is. I'm almost sure that happened. Mm. No, that's terrifying. I'm telling you. <laughs> Some of the other, I think, music names that I saw in researching uh, for this biography was that you were big on Albert King, Little Milton Campbell. Oh, yeah. Well, see, there, there was this AM station in St. Louis, KATZ. Uh, they have a jingle I still recall Mm -hmm. and they used to play the blues all the time 
And I listened to that station quite a bit. And I remember my mother listened to that station quite a bit. Although she was taken with this talk show host by the name of Onion Harton, H-O-R-T-O-N. Although I don't remember listening to him that much, but my mother used to listen to him all the time. And um, I have my notes, um, Chain of Rocks Bridge Story. Hmm. The, and that, that has to do with you and your friends going to St. Louis. And maybe that's the, the story with the, um, with the train and the car. Yeah, possibly. I don't, it seems like I would remember Chain of Rocks. So it's not ringing a bell. Maybe my long-term memory is failing. It's, I'm guessing some sort of harrowing situation on a bridge. Oh, maybe that was it. Uh huh. Maybe that was. Yeah. And do you do you remember the first song or artist um, or music that you really got into as as a kid? Um. Well, you know, I followed what was on the radio, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. The popular songs on the radio, the Motown sound, although probably more than most people, I probably listen more to the blues because of KATZ, that's likely. And I probably listen more to jazz than many people as well because of the influence of my older brother mm. um, and my younger brother for that matter. But and then, and then of course, just what's what's on the radio, popular songs on the radio, I mean, the miracles, the four tops. Uh, oh, um, the songs about Vietnam, mm. because of course, people were getting drafted right out of high school. So there were a lot of songs about the Vietnam War. One called "He'll Be Back." Mm. And this was this was go this is while you were in high school or going into college. No, uh, this is this is like beginning 65, 66. That's when the escalation began. Mm -hmm. Last year of high school. And you graduated high school, I think, in 60, 66. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So the Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, which of course was a trigger for escalation, if I'm not mistaken, was August 65. Mm -hmm. And then that leads to the U.S. escalation of the war, more of the draft, et cetera. When I was at Princeton, of course, you had to enter the draft lottery. Fortunately, I had a high number. People with low numbers were out of luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, extremely lucky, extremely fortunate. Really? And did, did you play any instruments uh, growing up? Yeah, but not, not, I wish I had done it more. My, my, my siblings, my older sister played the piano. My older brother played the clarinet. One of my older sisters played the flute. My younger brother, of course, is still playing the guitar. I remember fiddling around with many of those instruments, but never for that long, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, the and um, W. E. B. Du Bois passes away in Ghana on August 27th, 1963. Um, right. written several books about him. Were you right. already a fan of his at the, at the, in your high school years? Probably not. I mean, I don't have any imprinted recollection about that. Like I have an imprinted recollection about Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, imprinted recollection about going to an LBJ rally in St. Louis. And, 1964, when I was 15. Uh, imprinted recollections about, oh, the Veiled Prophet Parade, which was used to be a big deal in St. Louis. If, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it comes out of busting unions in St. Louis, mm -hmm. which is appropriate on the day before Labor Day. And it comes I think out of Klan activity as well, because the Veil Prophet had on like a Klan hood. And I remember, this is from in Mill Creek Valley. They would have the Veil Prophet Parade. <laughs> they would give out free food to the Negroes. So, you know, we all showed up. So, 
But that, that's all I recall. And then I remember also this guy who I now know, who's a, 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 a well-known St. Louis activist now in his 80s, named Percy Green. He once climbed the, the arch to protest lack of hiring. You know, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis? Mm -hmm. to, to protest the uh, lack of hiring of black workers. I, wow. I think also, during the Veil Prophet Parade, he actually snatched the hood off of the Veil Prophet. Mm. It was, it's, it was the Veil Prophet Parade, if I'm not mistaken, my sister would know this, was, was put on by the, you know, the local ruling elite mm -hmm. to celebrate some victory over labor and some sort of alliance with the Klan. You know, you, that's probably on the internet. I mean, Dr. Google can answer that. Right. <laughs> And also, um, on August 28th, 1963, was the same day as the March on Washington. Yes. Um, was that something that was that you were paying attention to, you or your family? Yeah, I probably paid attention to it, although there's nothing imprinted in my consciousness. I'm sure my mother paid attention to it because, you know, she tended to follow the news. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that probably means that it was imparted to me, but I don't recall anything specifically. And, um, testing your, your memory some more. Um, in the fall of 1963, you were 14 years old. That's right. A sophomore in high school. Um, what was going on in St. Louis in terms of the struggle against racial se segregation? Oh, I'm glad you raised that because <laughs> one of the uh, first demonstrations I went to was just about then. Of course, Dr. Google could, could give you the dates. It's the protest at the Jefferson Bank in St. Louis about hiring black workers. Because I remember going, it's in down, it was in near downtown St. Louis. And uh, I remember going with my older brother to this demonstration, this picket, this protest. And this is what catapulted uh, Bill Clay into the Congress. Of course, I wound up working eventually for Bill Clay. I don't remember that much about the demonstration. I just remember being there. Also, I remember as well, during that time, there was this area in St. Louis called Gaslight Square, which is not that far from downtown. And it was sort of the, the beatnik area. Mm. And I recall that uh, in addition to St. Louis, East St. Louis, we spent time in Gaslight Square as well, in the beatnik okay. area. I mean, you recall the beatniks? Um, um, vaguely. These, these are the people who, um, you know, beating bungle drums, smoking marijuana, I was wearing thinking. like rays, right, et cetera. Going back to the um, the Jefferson Bank protest, the, the St. Louis branch of, of CORE, the Congress of Racial right. Equality was involved. That's right. Um, and, I, and I learned that the slogan was uh, Freedom Now. Mm -hmm. Oh, which isn't the name of our radio show. Now. Right, which I was going to ask if that at all is connected. Yeah. Okay. You just informed me. I, didn't, <laughs> I had no recollection. Um, and you're, you had mentioned your older brother. That's, that's William Horn. That's right. Um, and, and he's now a, a judge in Kansas City. Yep, yep. Although I would imagine he's retired. I just found out, as a matter of fact, that his uh, granddaughter speaks Japanese. Oh, wow. I just found that out a month ago uh, because she's about to go to Oberlin, where my daughter goes. Okay. Who speaks Chinese. Oh, so wow. I feel very proud for the coming generations we have uh, two black girls who speak Japanese and Chinese. That makes me very hopeful. Yes, you've written a lot about Japan. Um, you speak a lick of Japanese. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another question, on February 21st, 1965, uh, Malcolm X was assassinated. Yeah. Uh, did, his, did his assassination impact you at the time? I don't recall that. I mean, you know, coming to New York, of course, it's all over the place, mm -hmm. but, or even in, in New Jersey. But I don't recall that much about that in St. Louis. I really don't. Um, 
And as a side note, because um, it's not a list on a list of the books that I have for you, you ended up writing a book, I believe, on Malcolm X. That's, that's yeah, it's in my papers in the Schumburg. It, it's it's one of these, you know, as they say in Hollywood, myself and the publisher had creative differences. <laughs> <laughs> and so the book has been buried in my papers. Can you can you say more about those creative differences? Uh I don't know. I mean, I have a very one-sided view of it. I mean, it was a young adult book. So I was trying to write in simple sentences, short sentences. Oh, he probably didn't like the theme because uh, that's when I was pushing this, this theme about, which I pushed, I don't push it as much now as I used to, that the rise of black nationalism was tied to the decline of the left, that this was a global phenomenon, Afghanistan being exhibit A, where the left-wing party is driven out of office and the religious zealots come into power. So he probably, I don't think, I don't think he liked that theme. A lot of people don't like that theme, as, as a matter of fact, it wasn't just him. Uh, so, the book was buried. And the book was intended for uh, a younger audience. That's right. I did a, lot, a number of young adult books. I did book in the Scottsboro case. My sister and I did these edited slave narratives for young adults. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to stop here um, or jump into your college years? We might as well do eight minutes on that. OK. Now, sure. I, I recall. As I, as I said in the book, uh, Upending the Ivory Tower, right. that uh, Princeton came into my field of vision because of Bill Bradley. <laughs> so things were, because he was a basketball player. He was in the St. Louis area. I think Princeton went to the final four. <laughs> and so I think some school counselors suggested that I apply. I recall that, uh, a guy actually came to our house on Dryden to interview me. Hmm. Uh, so uh, if I hadn't gone to Princeton, I probably would have gone to either University of Kansas, where my brother went, or Southern Illinois University, where Dick Gregory went, or Howard, Washington, DC. I think those are the four schools I applied to, and Princeton being number four. And, um, and I re remember when I left Princeton, of course, there was no internet. And, you know, they didn't provide me with much counseling. So I remember, so I, I remember we, we, I flew to New York. Somehow I wound up taking a helicopter, a train. And Princeton is only, only, I made it much more complicated than it was to get 50 miles south of New York City. And of course, I came to find out that Princeton was once the home of Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. who was still being celebrated then, at least in certain quarters. It still had a black community then. I understand they've all been pushed out. And um, I recall, I think I've written about this, if not, I should, that on December 7th, 1966, the 25th anniversary, of the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, that these Euro-American students had this mock lynching of a Japanese-American student. Mm -hmm. And th th there was a fair amount of racism, but you know, I mean, there, were, there, you know, there was a, a, a core of black students. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on the road. Like I said, I was, I was still in my party phase now. Mm -hmm. I mean, small P party. <laughs> so I remember sitting in class, I'd be figuring out what I'd be doing on the weekends. So, okay, this weekend I'll go to New York. Next weekend I'll go to Philadelphia. Weekend after that, maybe I'll go to Boston. You know, I was on the road all the time. All the time. They used to have this uh, event in New Haven that the Black students at Yale put on called Spook Weekend. Mm -hmm. 
and where a lot of black students from the seven sister schools and uh, Ivy League schools would gather. I think I talked in the essay and upending the ivory tower about going to pin relays, and mm -hmm. big deal. Omega by the sea, the black fraternity. Atlantic City. Atlantic City. I think mm -hmm. I, I mentioned that essay, I wound up sleeping in a bathtub. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I didn't necessarily have uh, room for hotels. I recall, in fact, once going out to Western Massachusetts when I was at Princeton, mm -hmm. you know, looking for some party, and uh, got stranded. And I don't think I had any money because you know, it's not like I had a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to hitchhike. I used to do a lot of hitchhiking. As a matter of fact, in my papers at the Schomburg, there's my hitchhiking sign from the Bay Area, which has Berkeley on one side and San Francisco on the other. <laughs> you know, where I was going. But so I remember in Western Massachusetts, I got stranded and I was trying to get back to Boston. Mm. So I began walking because nobody would pick me up. But then finally somebody picked me up. Now, what, what's the saying? The good Lord, this is one of my mother's, my mother was full of sayings. The good Lord protects fools and babies, something like that. <laughs> and I was in the former category. Because, you know, I could have gotten killed. <laughs> you know, I mean, hitchhiking? That's yeah. crazy. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> But then, you know, people used to hitchhike across the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, I even thought about doing that once. Uh, so I was on the road all the time. I remember going to Howard's, uh, Howard University's um, homecoming mm -hmm. in October 1966. This is week at, weeks after I got to Princeton. So I was doing this early on. But I still managed to do relatively well. I didn't do as well at Princeton academically as I did at high school. Speaking, speaking of being on the road, had you ever been to, to New Jersey before, no. before going there? Right. Before I went to New Jersey, I'd been out of St. Louis maybe twice. Once to go to Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas, where my brother was. And another, well, of course, to go to east, the east side, East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. many times. But that was part of St. Louis. But I recall also part of the east side, our family... Used, there used to be these places where you could go pick fruit hmm. for free. And we'd pick bushels of fruit, and then my mother would preserve it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you could have preserved apples for indefinitely. So out, outside of Missouri, Illinois, Kansas, that's it. And, and you had mentioned considering uh, other schools. That, did you visit those, those schools? I guess not. Kansas. Kansas. Uh -huh. And I, I, I still do research at Lawrence, Kansas. They, they have great archives. Great archives in Lawrence, Kansas. But I didn't know that then. And you had discussed um, Robeson. Yes. Uh, being from Princeton. That's right. He was actually turned away from Princeton. He was. That's right. That's why he went to Rutgers. In 1915. Well, Princeton was the Jim Crow school. I mean, it was the school for Southern slave owners. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a dorm that, uh, that I think is still there, but when I was there, it was you, what, what, in the 19th century, the antebellum era was used for slaves. Then it was used for students. Uh, and then I, I, I recall, I, I think I wrote about this in the Southern Africa book, because it has some memoir-like details, that when we had the demonstration at Princeton over apartheid, this may have been 1968, that we occupied the financial center, and then a bunch of students came to the financial center and started shouting, like, go home, go home. And I think I said in the book, I don't think they meant go back to your dorm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I, I, I had a, oh, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this in the essay. I remember one summer. So <laughs> I was like the character in Catch Me If You Can. I mean, <laughs> one summer in Washington, D.C., I got a job as a tennis coach, even though I didn't know, I, don't, I never, I was able to talk my way into that. Hmm. And uh, it wasn't like there was a YouTube you could go to and figure out. So I just sort of figured out 
what you're supposed to do. I mean, come on, it can't be that complicated. You have a racket and a ball. So you get over the net. And then the, the job ended early. Once again, I didn't have any money. And I used to hang out a lot at Rutgers. And they had an all-women's all college called Douglas College. And so I, I was made to understand that Rutgers had organized this summer session for incoming freshmen. So then I went to New Brunswick from Washington and posed as an incoming freshman. So I had a place to stay, food, <laughs> et cetera, made a lot of good friends. But the, the upside, I, I think, is that, you know, you get thrust into these situations where you have to sort of fit in, basically, mm -hmm. and make friends. And, and uh, yeah, basically sort of fit in and not give yourself away. So I think that was good training for something. I'm not sure. 